You are listening to the War on the Rocks podcast on strategy, defense, and foreign affairs. My name is Ryan Evans. I'm the founder of War on the Rocks, and I was recently happy to travel to Rammstein Air Base in Germany, where I sat down with General James B. Hecker of the U.S. Air Force and Air Marshal Johnny Stringer of the Royal Air Force. They are respectively the commander and deputy commander of Allied Air Command at NATO, and they had recently concluded a special invite-only expert pact conference on what Western militaries should be learning so far about air power and space power, given the experience so far in Ukraine. I hope you enjoy the conversation. So I'm catching you two gentlemen on the tail end of a major conference that you convened on air power, space power lessons, especially from the last year of what we've observed in Ukraine. Why was now a good time to convene this group of people? I believe something around 200 people ended up showing up for it, including some of the world's certainly NATO's leading experts on air power. Well, Ryan, first, thanks for the opportunity, and we uh, both really appreciate to be able to talk to you today. Uh, This was actually an idea that that Johnny came up with. As we are trying to get more prepared in case uh, Russia, you know, continues to do bad things like they're doing right now, we need to make sure that we're ready for them. And one way to do that is to get uh, a lot of intellectual think tanks and people together at one time and talk about lessons learned. And that's exactly what Johnny got set up for us. Uh, We had four different panels with uh, a lot of different variety of people coming from all different backgrounds that were able to discuss lessons learned out of Ukraine. And we learned we learned a lot over the last uh, day, day and a half. It's been really, really nice. Yeah, thanks very much, sir. And, and Ryan, great to, uh, to have the opportunity to do this today. I think also that the, the point is we're now 16 months into this. As ever, trying to draw lessons from any event runs the risk if you do it too early that you draw the wrong ones. But I think at, at 16 months, you know, we, we, we've got the time and we've had the, the space as well to look at it and, and draw out things which we think are important, not just in the here and now, but are probably going to set vectors for us for the for, for the near term and into medium term as well. So it seemed a great opportunity to get the folk together, as the, as the con was just mentioning, to to really have a have a broadest span of, uh, of opinion uh, that we could get in one room to, to, to unpack what we think we've seen over the last 16 months. Before we get into some of the specifics, I want to talk about this idea of learning lessons and how it applies here. Do you think there's a risk that we might overlearn from Ukraine? I think there's a risk in studying anything that, that, as I said, if you not carefully draw the wrong things because you're either looking in the wrong place or you're looking too early. I think um, even allowing for you know the potential of overstudying something, uh, I think the fact that European security has been upended in a way we haven't seen since the end of the Cold War uh, and what Russia has had to put into this because, frankly, their plan for a three-day war didn't come off means that there is a lot to look at and make deductions and implications from. So I think even aiming off for the for, for the possibility, as you, as you rightly say, I think you know there's, there's enough there to really, to really look at and, and draw some sensible deductions from. I think there is the ability to that we might overlearn from this, but I think you got to you know like Johnny said, they came in thinking that it was going to be a three day war um, against one country. If they were going to fight against thirty one countries, and knowing that it's uh, that it's you know definitely not going to be a three day war, I think what you you'd see is they're going to you know probably react a little bit differently than we saw them in Ukraine. And the other thing is, you know, they've been at this for 16 months. So they've learned a lot. And we've seen them change and them grow in their tactical capabilities and those kind of things. That we can really learn from and see how they're uh, how they're adapting and what they think is going to be successful uh, later on. I'm fascinated by this issue of how learning is then incorporating into actually changing the way we do things. And mostly I've looked at this from a U.S. DOD and U.S. Armed Services perspective. How does that work in NATO? So when you take what you've learned, for example, the last couple of days here at Rammstein, what then happens with that information and how does that get incorporated into how NATO thinks and then maybe eventually how NATO might operate? Well, we take that information and then uh, I get my top level staff together uh, and we bas- basically synthesize you know, what we've just heard and then we come up with a plan on a way forward. And we'll probably get into this fairly deeply as we uh, finish, go deeper into this podcast. And we'll talk about the, uh, the plans that we had before and then how this conference 
uh, even you know solidified some of those plans, but then added to some of those plans on how we plan to do preparation uh, in the future. There's a lot one can learn from Ukraine, and you alluded to this earlier in terms of it's sort of when you look back and decide to learn the lessons. As three months into the war, some of the lessons look very different from a year into the war to now. Uh, what are those major changes, at least phases from the war that you think, from the perspective of air power and space power that you two have observed since February 2022? Okay, perfect. I'll, I'll take the front end of this because I think we're fairly synthesized on, on our thoughts on this. But uh, the biggest l- lesson learned that I think really the world has gotten out of this is <laughs> what happens if you can't get air superiority? And I think what we've seen on both sides is neither one was able to get air superiority. And just for your listeners, you know, if Russia was able to get air superiority, which they obviously thought they were going to be able to do, it probably would have been a three or a 10 day war. All the equipment that the 45 nations has offered Ukraine and trucked in would never have gotten there if they're if Russia had air superiority. They would have had close air support aircraft right on the border of Poland and uh, Romania over the the lines of communications. And as soon as it crossed the border, it would have been done and they wouldn't have been able to get it. Now, the reason why they weren't able to get air superiority is because of both sides had very good uh, integrated air and missile defense systems. And I'll uh, hand it off so I'm not stealing the mic here all the time to Johnny and he can talk uh, the listeners uh, through on on why they weren't able to get air superiority because this you know highly sophisticated integrated air and missile defense system. Yeah, as as the com was saying, both sides uh, went went into this with on on paper some very impressive um, capabilities. What I think we've seen from Russians is uh, at the enterprise level that they really hadn't modernized beyond platforms. And so you you were looking at a force that was not joined, that was not prepped to operate in a way that certainly we in the West would would force package and use capability across all domains. Uh, And so actually they ended up having something that that was less than the sum of all of its parts. I think you also find from the Ukrainians, and very interesting to see what their head of defense has said, chief of defense has said recently on how maintaining access and seeking to deny access at the level that the Russians wanted to the air domain was one of the priorities for both Ukrainian strategy and Ukrainian operational design as well. And I think they've done a fantastic job in, in achieving that. They've clearly had very welcome support from a number of nations that, that has kept their air defenses in the, in the fight. But it has allowed them to contest in a way that I think the Russians did not expect and have found hard to adjust to over, over the 16 months of the conflict. I think it also has sort of broadened it a bit. I think it poses some really interesting questions for uh, notions of air superiority and air supremacy. I think at times people might have been guilty in the past of seeing it in quite sort of black and white terms, sort of either or. And I think what we are seeing in Ukraine is a sense actually of air access. What do you need to have and where do you need it and at what level? Uh, And that's going to be episodic. It's going to be time bound. But if you use it well, It really poses your adversary problems. Uh, And I think there's been great imagination on that front by the Ukrainians as well. Is it fair to call what the Ukrainians had, certainly in the first few months of the war, an integrated air defense system? Or was it more of a disintegrated system that they were able to knit together all these different systems that at least at the beginning weren't talking to each other necessarily? I think it was a little bit of both. They were talking together a little bit, but not nearly to uh, to the extent that they're talking together right now. They have a very, very sophisticated, robust, resilient integrated air and missile defense system, as does Russia. So what you're seeing is uh, Russia can't fly their airplanes deep into Ukraine because they get shot down, and they've shot down several. And likewise, uh, Ukraine can't fly theirs uh, into Russia because of that same reason. Because of that, what we're seeing now is, you know, 155 millimeter rounds going back and forth at one another as We started equipping Ukraine a little bit more. They got HIMARS, which now gives them a little bit more range and definitely more accuracy. 
Uh, and then we've uh, given them uh, harm missiles as well as some some different types of uh, bombs that are very accurate and those kind of things. So they're getting more capability. But as you're going back and forth with these artillery rounds, it just destroys a country. It doesn't matter if it's a school building, if it's a hospital or whatever. They're pretty ambiguous, at least on the Russian side, on what they're targeting. And there's mass casualties when you fight a war like this. That's why for us, it is so important that we get air superiority so we don't have to fight the fight that they're fighting right now because the Western world won't put up with those casualties and we don't want to just destroy a country. So I've, I've heard that before and I agree with it. And, and General Brown said something similar when I had him on the show. But do you think enough work is being done by NATO air forces at least to plan for those situations in which we still actually might not get it? And how do you campaign plan without air superiority if you're a Western military in this undesirable, suboptimal, to put it, diplomatically situation? Yeah, for us, what we're trying to do is show the need and how important it is to get air superiority. And I think people get that. You know, my Marine buddies, my Army buddies, they do not want to have artillery rounds landing on their head. Matter of fact, from the United States, the last time an American soldier died from an enemy aircraft was April 15th, 1953, a long time ago. So we have gotten a little bit spoiled, especially in the last 30 years, because we are desert storm, we got air superiority, we had to fight for it a little bit, but we got it really quick. The other wars that we've been in the last 20 years, it's been pretty much uncontested. So air superiority to a lot of people is a given. Well, it's not a given in this fight if we go to war with Russia. And we are practicing, and Johnny and I are putting in place basically a, a couple one two year plan to make sure that we have the capability to get air superiority by taking down their integrated air and missile defense systems so we can get that yeah and and, and just expanding on that ryan so if you look 10 years ahead there'll be over 600 f-35s in europe of which only 54 will be american which is a huge increase in capability for NATO's air forces. But if we're not careful, we admire 600 fifth-gen platforms. And what we haven't done is really think through the, the techniques, the tactics, and the procedures at a tactical level that really makes them effective. So one of the things we're absolutely focused on is building that counter-anti-access area denial, the counter-A2AD capability across the air forces in NATO, and doing our thing as a theatre component command, as AIRCOM, of bringing a number of lines of effort uh, together. Uh, and in fact, we are um, holding NATO's first ever WEPTAC, so Weapons and Tactics Conference uh, here at Ramstein next month. And one of these things we are specifically looking at, and we're not looking at too much to make sure we've got the right focus, is a counter A2AD mission. And a bunch of things which are already in train of which the WEPTAC is one, are going to come together over the next few months into that sort of 18 months or so look uh, to really make sure that, that, that we are match fit on this. And this will look at how you operate when you do not yet maybe have air superiority or trying to claw it back or trying to get it. Absolutely. And it's also worth saying, you know, back to the point where people think it's an either, either or, maybe we, we were spoiled from our experiences in Gulf War One in 1991. But actually the reality is, Things are not nicely linear. I've achieved this. I move on to the next phase. We're going to have to go and win the necessary access to the air environment at the outset of any, any action. But we're going to have to keep coming back and revisiting it because you don't just make the problem go away at the start against a smart adversary. So it's always going to be there. We're always going to have to be thinking about how ensuring access to the air environment, which, by the way, is for, is for all of the tra traditional domains, how we're achieving that early and then maintaining it as well. And, and just to maybe put sort of, you know, the, the, the foot stomper on that, on that final comment, if you don't have freedom of maneuver in the air domain, you don't have it in the other domains as well, in, in land and maritime for the traditional. And, and also one of the things we were discussing yesterday at the conference, and I would underline the space part of what we were looking at, not just the air part, is the vertical flanks importance has never been more important. And it goes from subsurface to geostationary orbit. 
So how do we maximize what we in NATO and our, uh, you know, our, our alliance nations and our partners bring to any potential fight and most importantly now bring to credible deterrence in the, in the, uh, in the air and space domains? Seems like aside from, of course, Ukrainian innovation and resilience, as well as Western material uh, support and intelligence support, a lot of Russia's problems in Ukraine have been caused by employment, force employment choices. And the land forces get a lot of attention here in terms of, for example, using spe- Russian Spetsnaz as if they were traditional infantry, for example. But there's an air power story here as well. Russia seemed to have been, and this has been written about in a bunch of open sources, including by Justin Bronco, I believe was at your conference, husbanding a lot of their air power in the early phases of the war. Uh, what do you think explains that? And how do you think that Russian use of air power has evolved over time? Yeah, well, we're not trying to provide a free critique for Moscow. What I would look at, and to be honest, some of us who are out in the Middle East during the sort of the high watermark of the fight against Daesh, but clearly looking at what the Russians were doing in Syria, would see a lot of commonality in, in, in themes here, I think. So at one level, it's very easy to be seduced by new platforms, and, and the Russians have recapitalized a fair amount of their tactical air force, and um, they've done it on a weapons front as well. But if you don't address all the lines of development, you know, coming back to the enterprise level approach, you know, stand by to have some flashy things that are not capable in the way that perhaps you expected when you were writing the check for the rubles that are going to buy these things. So I'll just give you know, maybe a couple of examples. Their targeting cycle, their ability to dynamically target, let alone the timeline on, on more deliberate static targeting, is is fundamentally different to that which we you will see in uh, uh, in NATO's air forces and NATO's forces more broadly. And, and is that a human failing, a technical failing, or both? I th- I think it's probably a bit a bit of both. There's probably something here in military culture as well, possibly strategic culture. But if you don't practice and if you don't bring all of these things together, don't be surprised if they don't work in a way that you hoped. And also, one of the key differences, back to contested air environment, in Syria, the Russians didn't have to worry about that. So they were able to employ a lot, by the way, of unguided and only a small percentage of precision, but they were able to do it with effective impunity. That has not been the case uh, in Ukraine. Uh, And again, picking up one of the the earlier points here, just look at their operations, you know, in, in in the close, so at, at, you know, at, on the front lines, basically missiles, bombs, rockets being, you know, for that great British phrase, lobbed in to the uh, into the fight with very, very little accuracy, and that does not, you know, that is not the hallmark of a top tier air force. And, and to be honest, you know, although we are probably seeing some improvements, and I don't really want to get too drawn on that, they have a long way to go. No, I think I agree with everything that, uh, that that Johnny said there. You know, from what we saw at the beginning of the war to what we're seeing now, they definitely we're seeing some improvement uh, on their end, uh, and we're monitoring that closely. And uh, we take that into account, and we'll take it into account on what we do with our counter tactics uh, based on what we're seeing. Let's turn to space a little bit. Obviously. Much of the space power element of this is hidden from public view and from the open source view. But one of the most remarkable things that we can see from the, the unwashed masses of us with the Dune House security clearances is, is the uh, prominent role that private space power has taken, particularly Starlink, uh, helping Ukrainian targeting and comms and all sorts of other things. Is this the beginning of a trend we should expect to continue? And how do you rectify private space power with what the interests of states are because they don't always converge? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, we are seeing a lot more that's coming out of the civilian uh, community, especially like you just alluded to with Starlink. The Ukrainians rely on that fairly heavily. And, uh, you know, fortunately, they're getting that for free right now, which is, uh, which is good for them. But we use it as well. And we're, we're starting to roll it into some of our tactics. And people like, you know, SpaceX they're able to launch and put so many satellites in orbit. It's such a cheap cost compared to what it used to be 10, 15 years ago. It's just amazing. I think during the conference, 
we got a brief that I think it said over the last eight years, we put something like 6,000 uh, satellites in orbit. It, 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 I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was basically equivalent to what we've done for the last 40 years or something like that. It was pretty close. Uh, and it's very important. And it's very important to the priorities that we're trying to get after at, here at Aircom. We talked about one of them, which was a counter A2AD. Space is a huge part to that, you know, all the way from communications to uh, helping us find and fix the the uh, the asset as well. Uh, and it's not just uh, it's not just space that allows us to do that. We have to have special operators that help us. We have Army that has uh, equipment that that they'll use to help target um, some of the uh, surface-to-air missile systems things like that. And then, of course, the Navy is very important with their their cruise missiles that they can provide uh, from the ships and those kind of things. But I think you're just going to see space become more and more important. And unfortunately, I think you're going to see space get more and more contested. And that's re- requiring at least the United States Space Force to uh, to look at a lot of defensive maneuvers as well as offensive maneuvers to make sure that space is there when we need it for real. I, I don't think this has established a direction of travel. I think it's highlighted a direction that's been there for really many years. What perhaps is different is if we were having this discussion 30, 25, maybe even 20 years ago, you you would A, not have seen just the number of space-based systems up there which are dual use and therefore the availability of them to people. You'd also not have seen, I think, the way that the access to uh, for the civilian sector, for for media, for NGOs, for, for for just about anybody really who can who can tap into one of these feeds, what that has enabled folk to do to generate their own level of understanding and appreciation is has been remarkable. And if you uh, rather back to the point of the de- democratization of technology, a lot of what we would have seen 50 years ago and i think to your point you know it was government owned it was highly sensitive the products the data and services that if we'd use that phrase then that we were getting from space systems were the preserve pretty much of governments and militaries and that was about it that is just so much no longer the case and also the level of capability that you can effectively just now buy off or access on the internet is 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 not a million miles away from from some of the very high end, you know, solely military capability. So uh, I think to pick up one of the comms points, what it's allowed the Ukrainians to do is is fight a sophisticated campaign, really leveraging everything which they've been able to bring into into the fight uh, and achieve outcomes that I reckon if we were looking at it before February the twenty fourth last year, we would not have expected them to be able to do. And it says a bucket load, by the way, about their innovation and their imagination and their purpose. Um, but I think that the access to commercial space has, has been one of the things which we've seen in the conflict, which has kept them in the fight. I'd like to touch on unmanned systems. There's been a lot of, you know, the Ukrainians have been very interesting in how, they, how they've been using some of these systems, but some of them have also, I think, over-promised and under-delivered, like the TB2, and you don't have to comment on that. But where do you see the Ukrainians being most successful in their employment of unmanned systems in this war, and how I mean, how might we learn from that? If I start at, at you know what what you probably call low end, it, certainly in terms of cost and complexity, look at the effective mass that they've been able to generate from weaponizing fundamentally cheap drones that, with a bit of imagination through your networks, you can now employ in a way that gives you a sort of 50 mile an hour precision weapon. Uh, And because they're cheap and they're ubiquitous uh, and you can source them from all over the place, you've got a pretty deep magazine there to draw on. And obviously even within that that low end, that's then quite compartmented from almost the sort of the speed racer drone that's got a warhead put on it through to things which are, you know, quadcopters or, or greater that are able to carry multiple munitions, through to those things. But, you know, you can now start hanging increasingly capable sensors on if you want to. Now, of course, as you go up that curve, 
things become more expensive and more valuable and less attritable. And so I'm clearly not going to speak for what the, what the Ukrainians have been doing there. But I think they've done a, a pretty fine job of working out where the sort of the cost benefit is. And then you get into the sort of um, the more capable systems, you know, but, and, I, and I can't talk to things like TB2 employment, and, and I shouldn't do as well. But I think the more sort of fundamental point here, and it was discussed at the conference yesterday, is at some point putting more and more capability onto a, you know, a drone in, the, in inverted commas does start becoming, it starts giving you that level of capability where it's going to impact on whether you want to employ it or not because of, you know, back to my earlier point, on can you afford to lose it or not. And at some stage, you kind of go, and this is what one of the speakers said yesterday, you get quite close to the point where, actually, I am now probably want to invest in the air vehicle itself that it carries and we've moved on from drones to somewhere else. So I think one of the things that, that this conflict has shown up is that blurring of lines now between unmanned systems take you into precision weapons, take you into, in this case, you know, crude platforms. Okay, so understanding on that curve where you are and what that allows you to do in terms of mass attrition, uh, I, I think we're seeing that play out daily and I think the Ukrainians have done a very good job of, of focusing their effort where they get the highest return. Yeah, I can I maybe add a little bit to that. What's interesting, because neither one has air superiority, the only way one or the other are doing deep strikes is either via one-way drones, UAVs, or via cruise missiles uh, You know, on the Russian side coming off long-range aviation bombers. So, you know, without air superiority, I think uh, drones start playing more of a more of a, a larger role than they have in the past. And, you know, for the Ukraines, you know, just the other day when we saw them have a swarm there uh, near uh, near Moscow, uh, that even though it didn't, you know, hit anything or kill anything, it had a psychological effect, I think, uh, on their entire country uh, throughout the information space. Um, so I think we're seeing it used in that regime as well. The U.S. Air Force, as you know, General Hager, has this concept, combat collaborative aircraft. Can you tell us what that is? This came up on a recent episode also with General Brown, but also how this might pertain to NATO. Do we see any of our NATO allies investing in or exploring similar concepts? I think we're all going to, uh, you know, because uh, the CCA collaborative combat aircraft are, are going to be used eventually with the NEAT uh, NGAD, but I think before that you're going to see it used with the F-35s. And as was mentioned earlier, over 90% of the F-35s here in the European theater will be from allies and partners uh, here in a, couple, in a decade. So, yeah, I think we will we'll see that used uh, with other uh, partners here uh, in NATO. And as far as what is it, I think we're trying to determine exactly what it's going to be. But I think uh, if you can kind of think about things that hang off of aircraft, whether that's countermeasures, uh, a pod that has countermeasures on it, uh, whether it's weapons that are hanging on off of a, an aircraft, whether it's a data link that can provide data link either to space or other aircraft, I think that's what the CCAs are going to be used for. You know, whether they're going to be used as a jammer, whether they're going to be used as a weapons load, whether they're going to be used as a sensor, whether they're going to be used uh, actively with a radar or radar mapping. They can, the idea is they do all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then you have somebody sitting in an F-35 or an NGAD, you know, 15 years from now, that is the quarterback uh, of the team of CCAs. And we're using AI to make it easy on the person in the cockpit to be able to control those things and hopefully make the person in the cockpit a lot more survivable. And then the CCAs take more risk, but obviously they're going to be fairly expensive, so we don't want to get them shot down either. Uh, but they're a little bit more expendable, if, if you will, than a manned aircraft. I'd like you to comment on how Russia might be able to reconstitute air power, both during how it's doing that during the war. Uh, and how it might do so after the war, whenever it ends. So there's some people that say, well, if one thing Ukraine has showed us is that Russia doesn't actually have any teeth, is they can't even conquer uh, this country next door, which they had a lot of knowledge about, and which they had to some extent infiltrated in, in some aspects, not as much as Russia thought. Uh, 
why do we really need to worry? So do you think that those people are wrong? Do you think Russia is going to be able to reconstitute military power in a way that poses a serious threat to NATO? Well, uh, not, you know, not talking about nukes, of course. Sure. Understood. Well, they, uh, you know, I'm not going to give them advice on how to make them better, right? Um, but I will tell you what I've observed. Uh, what I've observed is they are, they do have a learning curve and they are getting better. And we're taking that into account. So I think uh, if this war were to expand or if we had to declare Article 5, I think you would see uh, Russia fight a little bit differently uh, than they did. And I think they'll be uh, better than they were at the beginning you know, of February 24th, uh, 2022. So we'll be ready for them. And uh, we are ready for them. You think they'll be better even with the losses that they've suffered? Yeah, well, they're going to reconstitute those losses. But uh, yeah, they've, they've lost over 50 aircraft, um, and that's a hit to any Air Force. Uh, but they have a pretty, pretty, you know, they're pretty deep in the number of aircraft that they have. So, uh, so I think it's a little bit of a hit, but not a huge hit. Yeah, and I think, again, without yeah, trying to give tips, to, tips for free to the VKS. Oh, I don't know if they, they know what to do with them anyway, so... What I think you know, we, we would all observe, and this is no great secret, is um, long-range aviation has, has, has remained more than just a sort of fleet in being. Uh, and the Russians would probably say that actually their use of missiles in just about all forms um, has probably been one area of success for them. So when you talk about recapitalizing and, and, and where Russia goes next, for me, given that the, the threat that that poses in a 360 sense to all of NATO nations is something which uh, we as Aircom are very keenly uh, focused on. And therefore, how do you make sure that in the future you nullify what the Russians would probably see as, as a degree of asymmetric advantage at the moment? Uh, and if I could just bridge from that to, to pick up a couple of your earlier, uh, earlier points... Um, what that also shows is that you know, the IAMD problem set has got very complicated over the last 10 years. You know, a, a discussion back in 2010 would probably still have the, the elements which we'd all be familiar with. You know, with, there'd be radars, there'd be fighters, there'd be you know, surface-to-air missile systems, there'd be C2 that pulls it together. But now the, the threat surface is effectively from those weaponized drones at one end of the spectrum through to, you know, the first operational fielding of air-launched ballistic missiles, which is what the Russians have done with the kill joint. So the IAMD challenge looks a lot more complex, uh, and we're going to have to take a increasingly layered uh, approach, I think, to dealing with it. And it's interesting, for example, that radar laid AAA is now back in vogue in a way that perhaps we would have, have sort of gone away from it over the last 15 years or so. So I think the get parts have been particularly effective against you know part of the problem set in a way that you would not routinely want to be using Patriots to try and down a $20,000 or euro or pound attack drone. Something that does seem to be a major NATO issue and uh, is everyone's taking a hard look at munitions and magazine depth and industrial bases. From a NATO perspective, you're looking at Europe's especially industrial base and ability to produce munitions that are relevant for air power. What are some of your concerns? What's being done now to make sure that European air forces are prepared for uh, a war that hopefully won't come, but if it comes? Yeah, I think everyone kind of realizes this. Um, it's emphasized, I think you probably realize that uh, the Secretary of Defense from the United States gathers all the other ministers of defenses from typically about 45 different countries, and they meet about once a month. And a lot of the times it's here at Ramstein that they meet. And I've heard him every occasion that I've been present, on, present at these meetings talking to the other defense ministers, exactly what you just brought up on the need to talk to our industrial base and make sure that we uh, get deeper magazines, um, et cetera, and replenish what we've given Ukraine. And I think a big lesson here is, and it goes back to air superiority. I, I hate that I keep bringing this up, but... I don't think you hate that you keep bringing this <laughs> I up. I think you love it. Yes, I do. Because if we had air superiority, we would be able to attack where a lot of these weapons are being launched from 
out of Moscow, and then you wouldn't have to use near as many surface-to-air missiles to take down the incoming one-way UAVs or cruise missiles because you hit them before they even got launched. Uh, likewise, if you're able to take out all of Russia's AAA and tanks and everything from the skies, then uh, you wouldn't have to worry about trading 155 rounds uh, back and forth with them, uh, which we're obviously short on those uh, as well. So I think it's uh, very important that the, uh, the countries here in Europe start getting after this now, because uh, once you give the word go, you don't start pumping out surface-to-air missiles right away. It typically will take two years, whatever, to get the production line up and running and those kind of things. Uh, so it's very important that we get on this and we do it quickly. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And it's no surprise that that the Ukraine conflict has uh, had a galvanizing effect on this discussion. But absolutely, to, to the comms point, you know, there is a lead time on this. The only other point I think I'd probably make is there is a tendency to search for ever more exquisite weapons, which are ever more precise, have ever more capability in them. And it's some, some part of the target sets which we have to deal with, that is always going to remain entirely valid. But I think there's also areas where, you know, precise enough will be good enough as well. Uh, and that actually that gives you a in to um, giving you tactical employment options with deeper magazines that allow you to, to fight for uh, for a longer period if you need to. Uh, and, you know, some, some of the potential, you know, the, the potential fights we're in uh, are not going to be small and localized. And they're going to need a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of munitions which we're going to need to bring into that fight. So I, I suppose my sort of the heartening point um, to take away is the recognition across all NATO nations, not only that we need to do this, but already some of the tangible things we're seeing to, to you know, quantitatively, as well as, as, as the quality side they bring, but to quantitatively expand production line and production capacity in NATO nations. Holding these conferences, as you just did, are you know, laudable activities, but especially, you know, people from think tanks and experts in and out of NATO armed forces. But how much work is being done to learn directly from the Ukrainian practitioners of air power, whether they're pilots or other people, not just about operationally what's happening in Ukraine, but conscious lesson learned activities where you're talking to them and, and pulling them into our own learning cycle in some way? The panel yesterday, we had a Ukrainian pilot on the panel yesterday who is stationed here at Aircom, and he's here on a three-year assignment. And he was there uh, during the war uh, in a leadership position for the first three months of the war. So he was there February, March, April, and a little bit into May, and then he came here. So he is our conduit going back and forth uh, with the Ukrainians. And then I uh, have a meeting about every two weeks with the Ukrainian chief of staff of the Air Force uh, and we discuss different things on what he needs. And so we have a constant dialogue uh, back and forth with, uh, with the U Ukrainian air power. Probably very little to add on that. Obviously, you know, NATO nations um, have relationships with Ukraine on a, effectively a sort of bilat basis. And, and, and that is, you know, understandably not, um, not air comms business. But what has been, has been, been very interesting is on the six monthly sessions where all of the NATO air chiefs get together um, we've been able to, to, to pipe in um, the head of the Ukrainian Air Force to give his perspective to uh, to NATO air chiefs and his insights from what's been going on and and you know just that that level of connection with uh, you know an air chief who is who's leading his service in combat against Russia has been uh, has been exceptionally valuable. I mentioned a little bit about our priorities here at Aircom, and they, they come pretty much derived from the lessons learned that we've uh, seen in Ukraine. We hit the anti-access era denial. That's our number one priority because that's what gets us air superiority. And then uh, assuming that we can hold the Russians off, we know what they're going to do to us. They're going to come with one-way UAVs and cruise missiles. So we need to make sure that our integrated air and missile defense system here uh, in uh, NATO is uh, up to speed. So we're concentrating on that as another priority. And then a big thing is information sharing. Partners and allies are great, but you can make them much greater if you share information between one another.
And I'll give you a good example and a bad example. Good example, before the war started, the U.S. shared 30 points of interest to our NATO partners a month. We had a change in policy that allowed us to share more information, free of charge, stroke of a pen, and now we're sharing 3,000 a month. I mean, those are the, the orders of magnitude of increased capability you can do by information sharing, and it's free. It's a policy change. Uh, and you just have to trust your neighbors, you know, that they're going to keep it. Uh, we're not doing as well with F-35. As was mentioned, we have 54 that are going to be U.S. here in a decade, and there's going to be over 600 that aren't U.S. We need to make sure that those 600 are just as capable as the 54 that we have here. And the U.S., you know, fighter squadrons are getting smaller. You know, we're, we're, we're about half of what the number of fighter squadrons that we had when I came in the service. Um, so we have to count more on our allies and partners, uh, and they're very dependable. Uh, we just need to make sure that they have the information that they need. Now, this isn't a one-way street. Everyone's got their secrets, you know, uh, and there's plenty we can learn from the allies and partners as well. So uh, I'm asking them the same thing. Hey, as you can and as your, your country enables you, uh, let's share information. And then that's third priority. Our fourth priority is command and control and how we're going to do this, you know, when you don't have communications and how do we do this distributedly um, so it's not one, you know, you don't have all your eggs in one basket and those kind of things. We're looking at that. And then our, our last priority is we already kind of touched on, which is agile combat employment, uh, typically uh, called ACE. And uh, in case your, your, your listeners don't know exactly what that is, um, the way that we made our aircraft more survivable in the past is on an air base, we would put them in different places on the airfield, not all lumped together. And we would put sandbags in between them and those kind of things so you didn't have a domino effect. Uh, that's not good enough now with the number of munitions as well as the precision that the enemy can uh, use. So now instead of you know dispersing them amongst a base, we disperse them amongst different bases and then we change that inside the decision cycle of the enemy uh, so they never know where we're going to be at. So those are the, the five top priorities that we're really working with uh, here at AIRCOM, with the number one uh, being get air superiority through A to AD. Yeah, and I think the only thing I'd, I'd add, Ryan, Air Forces, I think, had a really good 1990s. So we came out of 1991 Gulf War. It seemed to be the case of air power is the answer. Now what's the question? And we did no fly zones and we weren't, con we weren't contested. But actually what was going on was our adversaries were taking note of how we were fighting and were getting after the ways to nullify and neuter those advantages and those way in combat. And then we had 15 odd years or so of counterinsurgency where air, quite rightly, largely supporting the land component, but a particular type of fight. And I think some of our thinking, you know, part of our sort of a conceptual component of air fighting power kind of atrophied a little bit. Uh, and then February 24th last year happened. Uh, and for those who'd sort of taken a bit of a conceptual holiday, I think it's been a real wake-up call. So getting our thinking right, really thinking about air power at the operational level, making sure that the, the thread from strategy down to tactics is a really, really solid one, it is really vital ground for us. And so, you know, almost back to your opening question, that's why holding a lessons event as we did yesterday and now really building networks and, and, and relationships with people who challenge and help our thinking is, uh, is really important stuff for us. Thanks for listening to this episode of the War on the Rocks podcast. Please don't forget our membership program at warontherocks.com slash membership. Stay safe and stay healthy.